uh, are coming back from illness and uh, just good to have everybody uh, in attendance here with us. If you are uh, new, if this is your first weekend with us, welcome. Uh, glad that you've come and, and uh, visited. We would love to have you uh, come back in a succession of, uh, of Sundays and, uh, and see if, uh, if this might be a place where you could find uh, God's working and, uh, and people who want to partner with you in following after Jesus. So, um, kiddos, good job on the songs today. Man, you guys... I mean, the, the choreography was on point-ish. Um, I, I, was, uh, I was a little nervous for our whiteboard as my son kept playing with it, but uh, it all worked out. Um, we're, today we're going to talk about discipling and, uh, and being a disciple. And so I want you to listen for that word uh, while we, uh, we listen to the sermon this morning. And uh, uh, we're going to learn a little bit about what it means to be a disciple, what a disciple does and what a disciple um, is. And so uh, just listen for that word as we follow along today um, for everyone else. Um, I always like to, to start you guys off with something to talk to each other about and watch uh, Casey just say the word watermelon. Um, <laughs> uh, if you would, take a moment and just... Uh, Share with someone who's sitting right there with you um, a thought that comes to mind when you hear the word disciple. What do you think about um, what is a disciple? Go ahead. Water. Okay, Laura. We're going to see if you can whoop that boy into shape again. Anybody want to share? What's a, what's a thought or an idea that comes to mind when you hear the word disciple? John, back in the back. A follower. A follower. Very good. Peter. Peter, okay, that works. Total dedication to Jesus. I like that one. All right, well, we're gonna we're gonna talk about that today. We're gonna learn a little bit about what it means to be a uh, a disciple. And uh, first and foremost, I guess let's just go with the definition of it. It's a learner or a student. Um, it is someone who is is learning something. Someone who is a student of uh, of a, a teacher. Um, I've been doing a whole lot of, uh, of reading and thinking through um, discipleship and, and looking at what that uh, looks like for us as a, a group of believers, but, but what it looks like for us each individually as, as a disciple. And so um, it's become abundantly clear to me that there are a whole lot of competing thoughts when it comes to what discipleship looks like. Um, there is a lot of things that we can cloud ourselves with and, and make it unclear. And generally, what I've found is that the more that you ask a minister, uh, a pastor, a, um, a church leader um, what, it, what discipleship is, the more that you will see that, that they, they view it through the, the lens of education and training, um, which isn't wrong. Um, it, it, that's part of it. Um, but, but it encompasses a, a little bit more than that. And so if we think about discipleship as a learner or a student, that makes all the sense in the world that education training would be part of what that is. Um, and it is. Um, but it's also an identity. It, it's something uh, much more uh, identity driven than just um, what we do or how we do it. Right. And so um, uh, many times you'll hear uh, someone say things like, uh, who are you discipling or who is discipling you? Right. Um, who is it that you're you're pouring your life into? Who's pouring their life into you? And I think that that uh, when we look at discipling as a verb um, like that, um, sometimes we take the, the the stress off of where it should be. Right. And so um, if we think of disciple as a verb and not as a noun, um, many times we can feel we can feel failed by the church because who's pouring into me? Um, who's who's giving me what I need in order to become a disciple of Jesus? Right. Um, whereas if we see it as a noun, if we see it as our identity, the disciple is who we are, um, and, and it's more of a binary, a one or zero, yes or no, am I a disciple of Jesus, then who is the responsibility on? It's on me, right? If I'm, if I'm Jesus' disciple, I need to follow after him. I need to be the one who takes up the ownership of that, of that discipleship. Um, and, and I really need to, to look after what it looks like to be like Jesus in the way that he would call me to be his disciple. Disciple, And so I think that helps us just in taking ownership of, of being a disciple of Jesus. I think it also, um, it, will, it will steer us away from, from what could be her heresy, right? It, it could steer us away from exactly what Paul addresses as he's talking to the, the church at Corinth. And he says, um, you're not an apostle of, or you're not, a, uh, you're not a disciple of Paul. You're not a disciple of Apollos, but you're a disciple of Jesus. Um, and, and he's trying to show these folks that, that while they have, they've built camps on who baptized them, um, that's, that's really not a good place to be because Jesus is the only one who has 
qualified to be our, our rabbi, our teacher. He's, he's the one that we're following after. And so together we partner in following after Jesus. And that's really where we want to be. Um, if, if we see discipleship, I think in that vein, we look at discipleship a little bit more like in a, it's an apprenticeship, right? It is, it is following Jesus for the sake of looking like Jesus. It is following uh, someone, if you think about just uh, apprenticeship in general, um, you would think about um, you follow around somebody who has a trade or an ability, and the more that you um, walk around with them, the more that you follow them, the more that you see the way that they interact and the things that they do, the more that you learn what it would be like to, to work in that trade. Right? Or if you thought about it as a, maybe a more modern day example as an internship, right? Um, and, and you take an internship and you go, and this might not be the, the, a good one-to-one -one because internship in, in my experience has been much more temporary and, and much less effective. Um, but the idea of an apprenticeship was that, that you would follow this person and you would learn from them the way that it looks to be their disciple or the way that it looks to be in their position, right? And, and so we see discipleship not just as a term or a position that was even unique to Jesus in the time of, of the, the scripture. And so um, the, the word disciple, um, if, if you look at it in scripture, is uh, methetus. Um, and Methetus is a disciple. You see this 261 times throughout the New Testament. This is the, the, the overwhelming majority of what we find in the Gospels as a description for those who followed after Jesus, right? The only description that you'll find more often in all of the New Testament is uh, uh, Adelphos, which means brother, right? Uh, that, that we see that all throughout Scripture because Jesus makes us a family. And so as they're writing to each other, they, they call each other brother or brother and sister. Sometimes it'll be um, translated. Uh, the idea that, that there's a, a familial um, connection to them. But the overwhelming um, way that Jesus would talk about those who would come after him was to call them disciples, to look at them as disciples. And so, uh, again, this wasn't, a, uh, this wasn't a terminology that was, that was uh, new to Jesus at the time. This is something that predated him in Jewish society, um, something that predated him in Near Eastern society. And in fact, if you look 100 years before Jesus came on the scene, um, people like, like Plato and Aristotle had mathetes, um, disciples. That's a Greek word that means disciples. And they would have these guys who would follow them around and learn their teachings. And, and really, uh, when we look at it from the Jewish point of view, um, there were, as best I could tell from my understanding and looking through this, there are four things that you were supposed to um, take up as, as a disciple. Um, four things you wanted to, to learn from your rabbi. And so the, the first thing, the first goal would be that you would um, be with your rabbi. You would follow him around 24-7 from village to village. You would go everywhere that he went. You would follow yourself and, and model yourself after what he did. As he went from synagogue to synagogue, every waking moment you would follow your disciple, you would, your, your rabbi. You would want to be with him as his disciple. Um, in, in fact, one of the Jewish proverbs of the first century was that you follow the rabbi, drink in his words, and be covered with the dust of his feet. Um, they, so just think about that, what that looks like, to, to follow the rabbi, to drink in his words, and to be covered with the dust of his feet. Right? And so you wanted to be so close to your rabbi, your teacher, the one who you're apprenticing, um, that, that you were you were just picking up the dirt that was flying off his sandals, right? Um, you wanted to follow him around with that kind of dedication is what he's talking about. And so that was the first thing. You had to be with your, your rabbi. The second thing was that you would learn his teachings, um, that you would learn his teachings. You would, um, what Jesus called, taking up my yoke, right? That was, that was a... a First century rabbi expression, to take up the yoke of your rabbi, which was to take his teachings as your own, to, to learn how he um, thinks about, how he interprets scripture, the way that he would think through um, biblical things. And, and, and in doing so, you would start to, to think like your rabbi. Um, you wanted to know what he knows so that you could think like he thinks. Um, and then as you learned his teachings, you would become like your rabbi, right? You would start to model your life after them. Um, you would not just know what he knows, but you would do what he does. That you would live like him, sound like him, be like your rabbi. And then finally, the fourth thing that, that would happen is that you would carry out your rabbi's teachings or work, right? That you would be on mission for that rabbi. You would want to propagate the things that you have learned. Um, we actually see this a whole bunch in, in martial arts today. Um, when you get a black belt, they almost always will ask you, well, who did you get your black belt under in jiu-jitsu? Uh, and so if you got a, uh, a jiu-jitsu black belt under uh, one of the Gracies, like, that's a big deal because it's a Gracie black belt. It's not just a black belt. It's a Gracie black belt. Um, or uh, under uh, 
there's another guy, John Paul, uh, I can't remember his name right now, but just trust me in this, right? Uh, that, that it's a big deal. Like, who, who was the one who gave you your black belt? And in the same way, in, in, in Jewish society, to be a disciple of a teacher was to say, this is who I got my black belt under, right? This is who I learned from. This is the one that I followed around. I learned his teaching. I'm going to act like him, and I'm going to carry out his teaching to the masses. And that's what it looked like to be a disciple in the first century. And so Jesus comes on to the, to the stage, and, and he, when he starts to invite people to come and follow him, this is, the, this is the cultural setting that he's doing that into. People will understand that when he says, follow me, it's not just like, oh, what's this guy up to? It's like, oh, this is a rabbi, and he's inviting me in to follow him, to learn his teachings, to be like him, and to carry out his mission on the earth. And so um, Jesus himself, as he's talking about this, he says that, that the student is not above the teacher, but everyone who is fully trained will be like their teacher, right? And so this is the picture that he has, that, that to come underneath of a rabbi, a teacher, is, is to take that teacher's teaching to yourself and to start to become like the teacher who's teaching these things to you. And, that, and that's what, what it takes to be a disciple of Jesus, to take his teachings, um, to internalize his teachings, to start to be like Jesus so that we might carry out the mission that Jesus had. You hear it all over the, the New Testament, but no more clearly than you hear it right there in the end of Matthew when he's giving his great commission, right? And he says, go and make disciples of all nations, right? I want you to carry out my work. I want you to go and, and make disciples of everyone that you see. Go to all of the nations and teach them. How are we going to do this? He says, baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you, and surely I am with you to the end of the age. Right? I'm, I'm with you always. Um, when, when Jesus came on the scene and, and he taught his disciples, it was for this reason, that he wanted them to carry out his teaching. He wanted them to go forward and make disciples of all the nations. He wanted them to go and to teach people what it was to, to follow after Jesus. Um, he, he didn't come with, with the idea of, hey, will you believe these things? Um, Rather, he, he taught them how to think about all of those things, right? And in fact, what you hear Jesus say over and over and over throughout the, the Sermon on the Mount is, you've heard it said, but I tell you, right? And so he's teaching them how to think about these things. He's teaching them that, that take away the, the cultural perceptions, and I'm going to show you what, what God really wanted out of these, these commands. And so the primary responsibility of a disciple um, then, and the primary, primary responsibility of a disciple today is that we would be just in this constant state of awareness of our, of our teacher, right? That, that we would walk the way that he walks, that we would reflect his character, that we would carry out his mission to the ends of the earth. Um, we, we hear this in the way that, that Jesus finishes there. He says, go and, and make disciples. Um, I want you to, to go and to baptize and to teach. And he says, I'm going to be with you to the very end of the age. And so what does Jesus do after that? you need something? Am yeah. I not coming through? I'm making a pause for a second. No, no, just, just the hypothetical. All right. I have nothing coming through. <laughs> Perfect. I don't think that means what he thinks it means. Um. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, where was I? I don't even know. Uh, he, he was, he was going to be uh, with them to the very end of the age. So where does Jesus go from there? He ascends to be, be with, with God. How's that work? Right? Well, we know from this side that, that the Holy Spirit was going to come. Right? Days later, the Holy Spirit was going to come. And he's going to indwell those people. And they were going to be with God all the time, everywhere, everywhere they went. Right? And so we hear this as, as Paul starts to... to talk to the people in the New Testament over and over and over. He says, keep in step with the Spirit. Walk by the Spirit. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. I, I don't know what's going on. I can, I can just try a... You want me to try a different mic? And just keep it on. All right. Uh, so the primary responsibility of a disciple um, today is that we would be in this constant state of awareness of who the Spirit is what the Spirit would have us do, that we would, again, internally, from the inside out, start to look like the one who has, has shaped us into his image. As, as Jesus says in John 15 to his own disciples, he says, I am the vine, and you are the branches. Right? If you remain in me, and I in you, you will bear much fruit, but apart from me, you can do nothing. 
right? And so Jesus comes and he takes up residence in our lives as, as you know, the Holy Spirit of God takes up residence in our lives to teach us the things of Jesus and to shape us into who it is that Jesus would have us be. And so again, I think that, that understanding this in the, in the shape of apprenticeship is, is helpful for us and giving us a window into what a disciple of Jesus is and what it is that, that he calls us to do. Um, following Jesus closely that we might learn from him, we might become like him, that we might ultimately carry on his work in the world. Um, but I, I don't want you to take my word for it, right? Never take my word for it. Let's look at it in Scripture. Um, so if you will, open up to the book of Mark, um, the gospel of Mark, right? If you're in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, second gospel. Um, we're going to look through a, a couple of different spots here in the book of Mark and just follow a, a, a pattern that we see Mark writing for those who would read his gospel um, of the way that Jesus calls those to come and to follow him. And so in Mark chapter 1, that's where we're going to start out at, I'm going to skip, skip through just a little bit, but it, it'll be all right. Mark chapter 1, starting in verse 16, it says this. It says, As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting nets into the lake, for they were fishermen. Uh, Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you to, be, uh, to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little further, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat, preparing their nets. Without delay, he called to them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. Now, if you just turn to the next chapter, right? Um, chapter 2, verse 13. Once again, Jesus walked out beside the lake. A large crowd came to him, and he began to teach them. And as he walked along, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, Jesus told him. And Levi got up and followed him. Um, a chapter later, let's skip to chapter 3, verse 13. Um, Jesus went up on the mountainside, and he called to him those, who, uh, those he wanted. And they came to him, and he appointed twelve that they might be with him, and, they might, and might, he might send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. These were the twelve that he appointed. Simon, who he gave the name Peter. Uh, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. He gave them the name Boanerges, because, uh, which means sons of thunder. Uh, Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Um, one more, uh, jump over to chapter 8. Um, and in chapter 8, verse 34, um, this is probably one of the more well-known uh, uh, teachings of Jesus, one of the, the ones that we hear all the time when it comes to the subject of discipleship. Uh, chapter 8, verse 34, hopefully I've given you enough time to turn over there. Um, then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. Whatever, uh, what, good would it would, uh, what good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet for forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? Uh, so in all of that, did you see the pattern there of, of come and follow me, come and follow me, come and follow me, right? Um, I'm going to appoint these, these 12 to be my representatives, and I'm going to send them out uh, eventually, and they're going to preach and to, to cast out demons, right? Um, that, that over and over and over, this is the, this is the, the model of Jesus, that he, he goes and he invites others to come and to follow into his footsteps, to be with him, to learn from him, um, to be like him so that they can carry on his mission. And so the call of Jesus was to come and to follow, to deny what they were doing, um, to drop what they had going on, and to come and to be his disciple, uh, to come and learn from the, 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 the master teacher. Um, in a, a book that I'm going to rely on uh, fairly heavily um, called Rethinking Discipleship, uh, a guy named Ron Bennett, um, he says it this way. He says, discipleship is the personal, persistent pursuit of knowing, reflecting, and sharing Christ. I'm going to re repeat that one more time. Discipleship is the personal, persistent pursuit of knowing, reflecting, and sharing Christ. Right? And so if we were to look at this as a visual, I brought out my whiteboard today. Um, if we were to look at this as a, as a visual, we might see this as uh, the, the, uh, the, the triangle of, of discipleship purpose. Right? And so if, if that's my triangle of, of purpose, um, at the bottom, it's going to be knowing Jesus, right? And then he says that not only are we going to know him, but we're going to reflect him. 
And finally, we're going to share him. And so he says that's what, that's what discipleship looks like, right? It's the personal, uh, the personal persistent pursuit of, of knowing, reflecting, and sharing Jesus, right? Um, and so if, if we were to, to look at, at, at this, again, triangle of, of purpose as a disciple, um, the knowing uh, portion of this would be our relation, right? That, that Jesus calls us into an intentional relationship with him. That, that he wants us first to know him, right? Because how can you, how can you possibly um, share Jesus if you don't know Jesus? How can you possibly trust Jesus if you don't know what Jesus is like? How can you, how can you have a relationship with someone, love someone, if you don't know them? Right? So first and foremost, the, the foundation of everything else is knowing Jesus, to come and to be with him so that we might know him. We might know his teachings. We might know what he looks like, what he lives like. And so that we might, in, in the end, end up carrying on the mission that he's given us. Right? Um, John talks about this in, in chapter 17. He says, this is, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. That, that knowing Jesus is both our, our greatest privilege as Christians, but it's also the greatest challenge. Um, that, that we are to, to constantly come into a better state of knowing Jesus as we walk with him and we follow him and we learn from him through the Holy Spirit and his, his opening of our eyes through scripture. And as we read these things and we find out what Jesus is like and what he calls us to be, we might know him better so that we might reflect him more and more. And so if we know Jesus to start with, then we start to reflect Jesus. We start to be uh, transformed, right? This is the, the transformation that happens I'm going to run out of uh, space on my triangle. That's okay. Uh, this is the transformation that happens, right? As we, as we start to, to transform into someone who actually reflects what Jesus looks like. Paul talks about this in Romans chapter 12. He says, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies uh, a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. And he goes on, he says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test what God's will is, his good and pleasing and perfect will. And so, again, it's the picture of, of transformation that happens through knowing Jesus and then reflecting him in our lives and being transformed into his likeness. Um, transformation is this reflecting of Christ, and it's not simply uh, behavior modification, right? It's not from the outside in. It's from the inside out. When the Holy Spirit takes up residence, all of a sudden, we start to, to look more like the Holy Spirit over time. There's a progression that happens. It's not instantaneous, um, but over time, we look back and we say, hey, man, I, I, don't, I don't like the same things I used to like back there. I'm, I'm not captivated by the same sins that I was captivated by back there. And over time, the Holy Spirit illuminates and, and convicts us of sin so that we might reflect Christ more and more. And as we know Christ and we reflect Christ, we get to the spot where we start to see the inevitable opportunities that we're going to have to share Christ, right? This is, uh, this is where we have the, the relationship, we have the transformation, and now we're on mission. Um, this is where we, we share the mission of Jesus. Um, that, that just as as Jesus came so that he might make disciples. We might, we might prepare other disciples that they would be better disciples of Jesus. That we, again, come together in partnership so that we can see them come to know and to love Jesus the way that, that he um, will, will make this relationship and transform their hearts so that they might also be on mission for Jesus. And so as, as image bearers of God, we are, we are purposed for um, this, this introducing of people to, to the Jesus that we know. Um, that, they, that those image bearers out there might know Jesus so that they can reflect him with their lives um, and be the people that they're called to be. Um, we, we need to, to die to self, to take a, 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 a step to the side and say like John the Baptist, that he must become greater and I must become less. Right? John the Baptist, when, when he's introducing everyone to Jesus, that's what he says. He says, listen, this guy, Jesus, he's the Lamb of God who came to take away the sins of the world. He has to become greater. And I need to, to take a, a back seat. I need, to, I need to remove myself from the center of this because I was the one who prepared the way. Now, I want Jesus to be the way for all of the people who are around him. Um, we should have the same attitude when it comes to, to, to knowing and reflecting and sharing Christ. That, that more and more and more, it's, it's us introducing people to Jesus so that we can take ourselves out of the picture 
and they will chase after Jesus with all of their hearts. And then we're just partnering together um, to, to chase after him in the same way. We become the truth tellers in a culture that is full of, of false belief and lies. We become uh, light bringers to a, a, a culture that is full of, of darkness and sin. And we become the remedy for a broken and a, a fractured world. Um, we, we become the, the remedy that, that God has, has prepared for people to come and to know and to love and to, to respond to what Jesus has done for them. Um, but listen, and, and, uh, and hear me on this, um, none of this, um, not the relationship, not the, the transformation, not being on mission, none of this just happens, right? All of that takes an intention. All of that takes us saying, I want to be Jesus' disciple. I am going to follow after him. Um, I'm, going to, I'm going to listen to what it is that he has said. I'm going to pursue after this teacher. I'm going to be with him to learn from him so that I can be like him and I can carry on his mission. But, but each and every one of us has to make that decision all on our own. Any of you guys ever use uh, Google Maps or Apple Maps on your phone? Yeah, like everything, right? Um, so um, Crystal and Charles, they're not here with us today. They, they're in, in Florida, right? After service last Sunday, um, they took off for, for uh, uh, Daytona Beach, uh, Ormond Beach, right there in that area. Um, they're going down there. They're going to play in the ocean and have a great time. I hope they're... Charles and Crystal, if you're, if you're listening to the message today, hi, uh, happy to see you guys. Make sure you bring back a, a huge uh, bucket of uh, crab legs for my son. He'll be so happy. Um, <laughs> he didn't get them when we were down there. Was, anyway, uh, they, I, I have no doubt, I haven't talked to them, don't know this for sure, but I, I'm almost positive that when they went to leave, um, they punched in a destination, right? A, a condo, a hotel, whatever it is they're going to. Um, they punched in this destination, and then it's the, they started to get turn-by-turn turn directions on where it was that they were going, right? Uh, when I was uh, taking my very first road trip, um, this will predate, um, for sure, cell phones, because uh, smartphones, because there were no cell phones. Um, this will, for sure, predate um, most GPS, really. Uh, when, when I was uh, making my first like, road trip across country, I was going from Ohio to North Dakota because I had to be there in two days uh, to report uh, when I was in the Air Force. And so I, I went to head out, and I didn't have a, a cell phone. I didn't have a, one of the you know, like Garmin's or GPS or anything. So I went to the, the gas station, and I bought one of these huge Rand McNally um, map books. You remember those? And it had all the different states in it. And so I, you know, I would have to open up to a different state every time I entered a new state so I could see where I was and what I was doing. Um, and, I, and I made this trek across the country for the first time as a 19-year-old airman that I was going from Ohio to, to Minot, North Dakota. Um, the benefit of having that on your phone today is that, well, first of all, um, those things are, are ginormous and they take up way too much space in your car. Um, and if, if you're using like traditional maps, from the time that you open it up to the time you try to put it back away, it'll never look the same. Um, but beyond that, what was, what was beneficial to having a, a cell phone and a GPS was that you knew where you are, right? I could pick up that Rand McNally nap and, and if I don't know where I am at the point in time where I pick it up, it's, no, it's of no use to me, right? Because if I'm, if I'm looking at the, the cornfields of Iowa, thinking they're the cornfields of Nebraska, um, following the directions on the map isn't going to help me at all um, because I'm, I'm not looking at the map of what I'm actually looking at. I'm just traveling down the street, right? Uh, and I think this is a, a perfect spot for us as, as, as disciples, as potential disciples, um, to think about where we are in relationship to Jesus, an opportunity for us to, to take a break. And, and we have this, this perfect spot in service every single week where we stop and we think about who it is that we're following after, who it is who has made relationship with us and what it looks like um, for him to come and to be the, the life that we don't live perfectly, um, what it is for him to come and die the death that we deserve physically, and what it is for him to overcome that death so that we might have a path back to the God of all of creation. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pass it over to um, Brad, and he's going to come up and lead us into uh, communion this morning. Good morning, church. Good morning. You know, Sean sent me his uh, information for the series that he's getting ready to do, and we talked a little bit about 
navigation and, and my mind kept being pulled back to the fact that uh, in today's world, uh, and has been as long as when I was a kid, uh, many of you hikers and people have been in uh, places where you needed a compass, you needed to have, uh, you need to have a, a source. Gravity is a source um, of how we navigate. It still is today. Right? Gravity holds our satellites in orbit. Uh, the gravitational pull of the Earth has magnetic, creates magnetic fields, which allows us to navigate using compasses. Uh, and, and it's irresistible and it's invisible. Um, as we were walking through Exodus and we got to the tabernacle, and uh, the, the way uh, God instructed it to be set up was that there's the camp, and then in the center of the camp is a tent. And that tent was very important because it kept the people's focus on a spot. Inside of that tent was a place called the Holy of Holies, where the God of the universe came to be with his people. And if you can think about, uh, you know, the reason we have gravity on Earth is because we have a, a planet that is constructed with a core that's very dense, it's very heavy, uh, and it causes a draw towards the center. That's why we're all able to stand here today without flying off into outer space. Um, that's the way it is for us in our walk with Jesus. It's the way it was for the Israelites in the wilderness. When, uh, when the tabernacle was erected and God said, I will come and I will meet with you in the center of the camp. It caused the people to have their focus on where God was. When God saw fit in the fullness of time to send Jesus to earth to tabernacle with us, to be in our presence, he became the focus of all that we are. And in fact, Paul talks about this a little bit in scripture. He says in Acts 17, um, he says that in, in God, in Christ, we live and we move and we have our being. We live, we move, and we have our being. That's how we navigate this crazy world, the chaos that we live in. Jesus himself said in John 12, 32, that when he was lifted up, foreshadowing his crucifixion, when he was lifted up, that he would draw all men unto him. That's a powerful force. Christ's death on the cross drew all men, men and women, all of us, to him. It's a gravitational pull of sorts. It's a spiritual gravitational pull. And Paul writes in Colossians 1.17, he says about Jesus, he says, in Jesus and through Jesus, all things were made. And in him, all things hold together. So today, as we come together here, let's fast forward to today. As we sit here today, each one of you who has been obedient to the gospel call on your life has the Holy Spirit of God tabernacling inside of you. God saw fit to take all the power that created the universe and that holds it together and to gift that to you as a faithful disciple. And that's how we navigate life. Christ is at the center of everything that we do. He's our focus. He's our being. He's our reason for living. And he loves us. And he calls us our friend. But he's our king and our brother. And when we come together and we take the bread and the cup, as his faithful disciple, we are saying, I surrender everything to you. Nothing I have is my own. It's all yours. Thank you, Jesus, for being lifted up and drawing all men to you. Let's pray. Father God, 
We worship you this morning uh, for being so loving and so patient and so kind that throughout all of recorded history, you have been at the center of all things. And as the Apostle Paul tells us that uh, through your Son, through Christ, all things were made and all things are held together. And we thank you this morning for the gift of His Spirit that comes and takes up residence inside of us to be our center, to be our source, our source of spiritual gravity that that directs our lives and guides our paths uh, and holds us together as we journey homeward. Lord, as we take these emblems this morning, cause our hearts to reflect back to our journey with, with Jesus and to be grateful for all that he has done and all that he is to us. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. So here's the, uh, here's the problem that you and I have. Um, in a, a recent Gallup poll, 76% um, of Americans identified themselves as Christians. Uh, when given like that, that question of religious affiliation, um, you know, you just check it on, on, on the box. It has a list of different you know, things that you can check. 76% of people check Christian, right? Um, but when other independent organizations have come behind them and kind of tried to ferret that out and said, okay, well, let's, let's think about what, what you think about God. Let's think about what you think about the Bible. Um, let's think about, you know, just like simple things of what it means to follow after Jesus, like um, reading your Bible, uh, praying regularly, um, going to church, giving to the church, serving the church. Um, what we find is that uh, less than 8% actually follow Jesus. Right, so um, 76% will will check the box. Will say, "Listen, I, I'm there." And and then when you look at, at all of America and you say, "How many of you do you know these these sets of things that would be indicative of someone who who genuinely follows Jesus?" It's just it's a lot a lot lower, right? Less than 10%. Um, and, and we wonder um, why we in the church have such a PR problem, right? Um, because there are are so many. Um, that, that claim the name of Christ without wanting to be like Christ. There are so many who, who identify with Christ without being a disciple of Christ. Um, and so that's kind of our starting point for, for where we are here, right? Because this wasn't, this didn't come about today in America. This, was, this is something that goes all the way back to the time of Christ. In fact, um, that if you look all the way back in, in Scripture, um, there, there, when we think about disciples, we might think about those 12 men that I named earlier, right? That Jesus went up on the mountainside. He said, these are my, my guys, these, these 12 men. Um, but we know that, that they weren't the only disciples. They were just kind of a leadership group of, a, of disciples who were going to become the apostles, right? But, but rather, um, later on, Jesus sends out 72 disciples into all of these towns so that they can spread the good news. Um, prepare them for him to come into those towns and, and tell them the gospel. And so he sends them out, right, 72 of them. Um, we know that, that later on, before, um, after Jesus' uh, death, burial, and, and resurrection, um, that there were 120 that were meeting with Peter. 
Um, so, you know, the, again, a, a much larger group than just 12 people. Um, we, we know that, that there were more to the disciples than just 12, right? So let's just have that as a, as a starting place. Um, but what we see all throughout um, the New Testament is, is this, this distinction that's made between the disciples and the crowd. Um, listen to the way that, that Mark did this back in, in Mark chapter 8. We read it a moment ago, but Mark says this. He says, Jesus called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Right? And so Mark is, is just about begging us um, as, as the reader of that to say, okay, well, where am I in that? Um, am I in the crowd or am I a disciple? Um, which is it? Right? But notice that the, 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 the distinction that Jesus makes there of saying he, crawled, he called the crowd and he called the disciples together. But when Jesus goes ahead and gives the invitation, what's he say? Whoever wants to be my disciple, right, uh, must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. Right? The, the invitation is, is universal. Um, whoever. That's anyone, right? Um, whether you're part of a 76%, whether you're part of an 8%, however that, that shapes up for you, he's calling each and every one of us, hey, where are you at? Uh, are, are you willing to be my disciple? Are you willing to deny yourself, to take up a, a sacrificial position? And to follow after me. I think that's the question that each and every one of us, as we, as we start this journey, need to, need to think through, um, consider, evaluate, answer. Um, where am I? Am I a face in the crowd? Or am I a disciple? Am I following after Jesus? Do I want to be around him so that I can learn from him, be like him, and carry on his mission? Dallas Willard writes this. Um, it's in uh, the, the Great Omission, uh, a book by Dallas Willard. He says, The greatest issue facing the, the world today, with all its heartbreaking needs, is whether those who identify as Christians will become disciples, students, apprentices, practitioners of Jesus Christ, steadily learning from him how to live the life of the kingdom into every corner of existence. Do you see what he's saying there? there there's, there's this... There's this distinction that, that he's pointing out to us, that, that one of the problems that we have as Christians is that far too many people want to be Christian but not be like Christ. Um, far too many people want to carry a name as a title and not an identity as who we are, that we are disciples of Christ. We want to be near him so that we learn from him, so that we will become like him, and so that we will carry out the mission that he's given us. Jesus didn't show up um, asking people, Hey, uh, here's, here's the list of, of, uh, of statements of faith. Do you believe all of these, right? He, he, he said, come and follow me. I'm going to show you those statements of faith in the way that I live. I'm going to show you everything that I believe and everything that I know to be true about God by the way that I love the people that are around me, by the way that I, I, I heal the brokenhearted, by the way that I, I bring whole those who are broken by the world, by the way that I love my neighbor as myself, I'm going to show you that I love God with all of my, my passion, with all of my, my heart, my mind, my soul, my strength. I'm going, to, I'm going to show you guys what it looks like. And so he says, whoever wants to be my disciple, deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. Right? He's, he's asking each and every one of us, um, do, you want, do you want to deny yourself for the sake of Jesus? Do you want to take up the cause of Jesus Christ? Do you want to follow in the footsteps of the one who we are calling the Savior? Um, I think if, if Mark, were, um, Mark were to include me in his story, which one would he set me? Would he set me in the crowd? Or would he set me as a disciple? And I think that each and every one of us should think through that. And think, where am I? Um, what would it look like for me to be the disciple that Jesus has made me to be? Because being a disciple uh, may sound incredibly difficult when we put that kind of, of focus and attention on it, right? But let me just leave you with a piece of, of encouragement, right? Um, so Darren Shoemaker, <laughs> who I'm almost positive if I had asked him beforehand if I could do this, he would have said no, so I, I didn't ask. Uh, I'll just beg for forgiveness afterwards. Darren has signed up for St. Jude's um, half marathon, right? 
Um, Darren, I don't know if you know this, if you, if you follow him on, on Facebook, over the past month, um, four straight weeks, he did 5Ks. Um, four straight Sundays, or Saturdays, I guess Saturdays, uh, he, he was running 3.1, is that 5K? 3.2. 3.2, okay, 3.2 miles um, in order to, to run after something that, that he's, he's chasing after, which is to get into to the shape he wants to be, to, to get into a state of life he wants to be in. He's, he's dropped 60 pounds. Um, he's, he's running constantly. He's training. Um, but in order to do a, a, a half marathon, 13.1 miles, right, that's not something you just decide one day, hey, tomorrow I'm going to get up and I'm going to go run 13.1 miles. Um, it's something that takes intentionality. It takes a, a lifestyle, right? It takes training. It takes, he's doing CrossFit right now and he's, he's, he's training in his endurance and he's, he's shedding pounds because he wants to be in a state where he can go 13.1 miles. And in the same way for each and every one of us, if we want to be a disciple of Jesus, it takes us intentionally saying, that's what I want to be. That is who I want to be. That is who I am. I, I am saying that I am. And so I'm going to deny myself. I'm going to take up the cross and I'm going to, I'm going to follow after Jesus. And in so doing, we, we take small steps. We, we, we practice the things that, that Jesus talks about. And, and we, we fail at times, but we, we pick ourselves up and we say, man, I'm going to follow after Jesus. And it is, it's in the same way that, that you go from, from couch to 13.1 miles, right? Um, over, over the course of uh, December, I think, is when you're going to be um, running in that race. And, and I don't know, you started doing 5Ks two months ago? Two months ago. And so um, over the course of six months, couch to 13 miles, right? Um, that, that takes little, little incremental steps over a long amount of time so that you can, you can do the goal that, that has. And, and it's the same thing for us, right? If we want to be the people that God has called us to be, it's, it's small incremental steps over a long amount of time so that we might do God things in, in our lives. We might see him move us from one place to another where, where we are being built into the people that he would have us be. That, that we would be, become intentional disciples over the, the, the course of our lives um, that we would intentionally follow after Jesus so that we might learn from him. We might be like him. We might carry on the mission that he has for us. And how do we do that? By following him, by, by coming close to him, by, by opening up scripture and seeing what it says about our lives and who he was, um, by, by patterning ourselves after his life, by, by saying what he says is the bedrock for what I believe, and I'm going to follow after Jesus with everything that I have. And so we lean into our relationship with Jesus, we reflect his character and we carry out his mission so that we might lead everyone to find and to follow Jesus. Let me pray to that end. Our Father in heaven, we just thank you again for a, a moment in time when we can come and be um, not in your presence because we know you're present everywhere, but in your presence in a specific way. Um, when you draw the church together, Lord, you dwell with us differently. And Father, as we, as we come around your, your uh, feet this morning and we learn from the things that, that the disciples have passed on for us to read about who Jesus was and what he was like so that they might carry out the mission that he had in their lives, um, Lord, we want to pattern ourselves in the same way. That we might draw close to your son through um, the, the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the word of God written out for us, that we might look in and to know Jesus in such a way that we start to be transformed by that word. That by the renewing of our mind, we are, um, we are transformed in our lives, that we reflect him more and more, and that, that we would share the mission of Jesus, that we would be about the work that he has given to each and every one of us who calls ourselves his disciples, that we would be a disciple who makes disciples by baptizing by teaching everything that you have commanded us, knowing that you are with us every single step of the way. Father, I, I just pray a blessing over the, the, this congregation of people, this, this, 
this group that has gathered here today, that, that you will make yourself real in the lives of each and every one of us. If it's for us to be refocused on, on being a disciple of Jesus, maybe we've gotten stagnant and we need to, we need to move forward in our faith. Father, I, I pray that we would take the baby steps necessary to see over a long period of time the change that you can make in our lives. Um, Father, if there's one here today who doesn't know the name of Jesus, who's never claimed what it is to be a follower of Christ, um, Lord, I, I pray this would be the day of salvation for that individual, for that group of people, for whoever it is, Lord, that, that through the Holy Spirit, you would inspire them to step out in faith and follow after Jesus. For each and every one of us in this room, Lord, we know that, that you are calling us not to be a face in the crowd, but to be a disciple of the, the great master teacher, Jesus. So, Father, as we, as we come and we sit here today and we sing out these songs and we take communion, and as we go into this week, we just ask that you would renew the purpose that you have given us in life. Help us, Lord, to know your Son, that we might reflect him and share him with a broken world. We love you and we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for what you have done for us by giving your son to die in our place for our sins. And we lift up the name of Jesus this morning as we pray these things. In his name we pray. Amen. Will you stand with me? We're going to have a, a song of response and reflection, an opportunity to, to respond to what it is that, that Jesus is calling you to today. Um, and maybe that is to step out in faith and say, man, I want to follow after Jesus. Um, I'm going to be right up here in the front. I would love to talk to you about what the next step is in that regard. Uh, maybe it is from right where you are to say, man, I'm going to, I'm going to, today's going to be the day where I plant my flag in the ground. I'm no longer a couch sitter. I'm a, I'm a half marathoner and, and I'm going to start moving toward the goal of being a disciple of Jesus in the way that I want to be, the way that he has called me to be. That's where you are this morning. You can do that right from where you are. Just plant that flag in the ground and say, man, I'm going to move forward with you. I'm going to start reading, I'm going to start praying, I'm going to start, I'm going to start thinking in the way that Jesus would have me. Wherever you are this morning, don't put off what, what God is prompting you to through the Holy Spirit for another time. Take care of it now. Place your foot in the ground and say, I'm going to move forward with you, God. I'm going to love you like I should.